Recording? Okay. Well, hi, everyone. I'm happy to introduce our last speaker of the, everything going well still with the video? Okay. Hello? Um, <laughs> Proud to introduce our last speaker, Andrew Wilson. Andrew just finished up his PhD at Cambridge, right? Yep. Uh, and is now starting as a postdoc here at CMU. And he'll be talking to us about kernels and new methods in uh, all sorts of kernel mess. All sorts of kernel exactly. stuff. Exactly. It'll be all about kernels all right. and probabilistic models. I'm very here, uh, excited to be here and talking about what I think are promising new directions for kernel methods, in particular, building models for automatic representation learning, pattern discovery, and extrapolation as opposed to interpolation or smoothing. I'll start by asking you whether you've ever spent months trying to learn something and then after you've learned it, thought that uh, you probably could have explained it to yourself in maybe 20 minutes if only you could build a time machine and go back and find the right words. Uh, I've definitely felt that myself and part of this talk will be what I would actually say to myself if I did have that opportunity to go back in time to the beginning of my PhD. We'll discuss high level ideas, how to best represent our beliefs in a model, uh, how we might be able to develop some intuitions about what will cause a model to possibly perform well or not perform well before we actually code it up and apply it to some data sets. We'll talk about how we can adapt a model to make it perform a lot better on a data set of interest. There'll also be uh, a very practical element to this talk. By the end of the lecture, uh, it would be great if everyone could code up a Gaussian process in under 20 minutes, it really only takes about 20 lines of code, and to uh, choose a kernel that will be appropriate for a problem of interest. We'll be discussing all sorts of different kernels and building up intuitions about what kernels will do different things and how to choose a kernel that seems appropriate for a given problem and how to combine kernels together to develop an appropriate statistical model for a data set of interest, and even better, how to build very expressive kernels that can automatically learn an appropriate representation of the data and enable extrapolation. We'll also be discussing how to scale up expressive kernel learning approaches to large multidimensional data sets. And it turns out that this involves very different challenges than scaling up standard kernel machines. I understand that uh, there are a variety of backgrounds in the audience, and so uh, ranging from beginners to advanced researchers, so I'll try to include something for everything, everyone, and in particular, I'll uh, try to discuss fundamental concepts which aren't often brought up in textbooks or in lectures. So this is an overview of some of the topics that we'll discuss in part one today and in part two tomorrow. A lot, if we talk about, a lot of what we talk about today will be leading up to tomorrow's lecture, where we'll actually build some expressive kernel machines and test them out on some practical pattern discovery problems, such as image impating. So lecture two tomorrow will essentially exemplify the concepts that we introduce in the first lecture today. So if you've been doing machine learning research for a while, you've probably been asked quite a lot by your friends outside of the field what it actually means to do machine learning. We're in kind of an unusual position in that machine learning is a fairly young field. Uh, it's very quickly evolving. It's got a lot of overlap with statistics and engineering and computer science and cognitive science and neuroscience. And uh, researchers from each of those disciplines have contributed a lot to machine learning. In fact, uh, there are entire lectures discussing what exactly it means to do machine learning. In general, it's agreed, I think, that machine learning algorithms adapt with new information versus having fixed decision rules. This is an essential quality of intelligent systems. And in a way, uh, a lot of us are actually trying to, are striving towards developing an intelligent system which uh, can learn and make decisions without human intervention. So rather than just trying to equip people with tools to analyze data, we're trying to fully automate the learning and decision-making process. Uh, it's uh, a very challenging ambition, and uh, it could explain some of the applications that we've really focused on recently and uh, some of the different types of models that we generally favor. Definitely automation is a theme that occurs throughout machine learning research. Now, in order to build a model which will automatically learn and make decisions, this model has to be able to discover patterns and extrapolate those patterns to new situations. And we'll start by just considering a few simple pattern recognition problems. 
So if you were to look at this data set, which is just airline passenger numbers recorded monthly, and you had to make an extrapolation up to, say, 1961, you would start by looking at some patterns and some trends and trying to generalize them far away from the data. In fact, we would be helped by uh, the functions that we were able to represent in our mind before we even looked at the data and the sorts of biases that we have. And then we might draw something that looks like this, but probably not. Maybe that could be uh, an extrapolation performed by an alien with very different inductive biases. So an alien that has uh, a bias towards very smooth functions, for example. Uh, you'd probably be happier with something that looks like this black curve here. Uh, it probably fits in a lot more with our inductive biases. Uh, using the language of Bayesian nonparametrics, it might be considered a likely draw from our posterior over functions conditioned on this blue training data. But, you know, perhaps the alien isn't actually that stupid. Maybe uh, it sort of predicts the advent of quantum teleportation or something like that, which just uh, outdates uh, airline transport as a mode of travel. And maybe uh, it just doesn't give a lot of credence to the uh, quasi-periodicity that it sees in the data, because in its, in its experience, that hasn't been very important for being able to make good predictions. And in fact, it might have a different loss function. So maybe the red curve actually isn't so crazy. Uh, in this example, it is, because the truth is in green, and in fact, the alien and the human here are actually two different Gaussian processes with two very different kernel functions. The red extrapolation is made using uh, an RBF kernel, far and above the most popular kernel, and uh, the black curve is using a different kernel, uh, in this case, a spectral mixture kernel, which we'll introduce in the next lecture. In short, the ability for a model to be able to learn from data depends on its support what solutions it's able to represent a priori, and its inductive biases, how it distributes that support, which solutions it thinks are a priori, a priori possible. So we've considered some examples in function learning. We could also think about examples in character recognition. In that context, the support would be which characters we think are possible, the inductive biases, which characters we think are likely. In general, it makes sense to have uh, as much support as we possibly can to represent any possible solution, even if it's just got sort of epsilon probability, and then to distribute that support so that we can extract useful information from the data. Uh, there's a saying, it might originate with Radford Neal, that whenever we have a simple model that performs well, we can always build a more complicated model that performs better. And he uh, uses character recognition to uh, exemplify that statement by saying that we can always account for irregular handwriting styles or strange ink blots to just get a bit better performance. In the language of support and inductive biases, that means that we might want to enlarge our support, but still concentrate our inductive biases in a way that resembles what the simple model is doing. It's been recognized by cognitive science researchers that uh, the human ability, human ability to make remarkable generalizations from a very small amount of data, for example, you know, a child seeing a picture of a horse and then being able to correctly identify all sorts of other types of horses, could be explained from having an expressive prior distribution combined with Bayesian inference, for example. So I'll start by building up statistics from scratch very briefly. There'll be a little bit of overlap with Zico's great introduction to machine learning, but there'll be uh, a focus on the concepts that we'll be using again and again in this talk, and on some concepts that don't typically appear uh, in textbooks. And also, this will just be an opportunity to introduce a lot of notation that we'll use throughout the talk as well. So let's suppose we have a basic regression problem. Uh, we have a training set of n targets or observations denoted by this vector y, y of x1 up to y of xn. So these could be different airline passenger numbers evaluated at different times represented by this input vector x and we want to make a prediction at some test point x star, which could be 50 years in the future, for example, or you know, uh, 2054. Uh, please, by the way, ask me if anything is, any, is, is at all unclear at any point in the talk. I'll be uh, asking a lot of questions during this talk, and hopefully we can brainstorm a bit together. And uh, especially even if it's about notation, just ask and, uh, early on so we can make sure everything's really clear. So if I were given this setup, and uh, I were asked to try and solve a problem like this in high school. If I saw these data points and I had to have some kind of formal way of predicting what was happening in the future, I would think, okay, well, you know, I'm familiar with polynomials, cosines, um, 
uh, a certain family of functions, and uh, I could combine them in different ways to uh, be able to capture the rising trend and the periodicity, and I would probably have some free parameters, and if I'm making predictions, I should be doing it with respect to some kind of error function, so I would uh, define some kind of error function and then minimize that with respect to the free parameters in my model. And there are a lot of choices we can make for different models. We could choose linear models or linear basis function models uh, uh, or even transformed linear basis function models, uh, which are called generalized linear models. And we could even use those generalized linear models as so-called adaptive basis functions, for example, in a neural network and combine them together in an interesting way. Uh, but essentially, we would think of some kind of functional form and try to minimize the free parameters of that functional form with respect to an error measure. Just as a concrete example, this five-vector basis functions, for example, could uh, contain uh, one x, x squared, and you could have a vector of weights, which is uh, w naught plus w one x plus w two, oh, sorry, w naught w one w two, um, uh, in which case we have a polynomial regression model. Or we could explicitly account for noise in the data. Uh, we could follow a probabilistic approach, which says that uh, if we have I D Gaussian noise, that uh, uh, our data is generated from some kind of noise-free functional form, and then noise is layered on top, and we can write down our uh, observation model as in equation one, where the expected value of any observation will be our uh, noise-free function uh, conditioned on our parameters, and the variance of that observation will uh, have noise variance sigma, sigma squared. And we can build up our likelihood and then optimize that with respect to our free parameters. But if we write down the log likelihood, we see we end up with exactly the same error function as we had when we used squared loss. And so we'll make exactly the same predictions in this instance. Uh, so the likelihood uh, in this case allows us to interpret a chosen error measure. We may have better intuitions about whether we have Gaussian noise or we could do things to try and figure out if we have Gaussian noise uh, than whether we should use squared error. And uh, we can, for example, use Laplace noise and recover uh, an absolute value error function. So we could, we could use this probabilistic approach to motivate different loss functions. And if the model is well specified, we can get a sense of the noise. And if it looks, for example, like there isn't much noise in the data set, uh, but we learn a really big value for the noise variance, that might suggest that our model is misspecified. However, both of these approaches are prone to overfitting. If we have a very flexible functional form, we end up with low error on the training data and high error on the test set. We can remedy this with regularization, so we can write down uh, a penalized uh, objective function where we have a model fit term represented by our likelihood or our error function or our log likelihood, and then we add a complexity penalty and uh, we can learn how much we want to penalize complexity by tuning this lambda parameter through something like cross-validation. Uh, this approach has the drawback that we don't necessarily even know what complexity is, and it can be hard to know how much to penalize it, it can be hard to choose what kind of validation sets we want, uh, and it can even be computationally intensive if we have a lot of regularization parameters to tune. And the reason we need to do cross-validation is because we can just trivially set lambda equals zero to optimize this uh, objective function. So, uh, I think we've been in introduced to cross-validation, so I won't go through that. Another approach would be to use Bayesian inference to represent uncertainty over the parameters in our model, and then infer a posterior distribution over those parameters, and then integrate those parameters away through the Bayesian model average in equation 7. We can interpret this integral in equation 7 as an infinite average over all sorts of different models corresponding to different settings of the parameters weighted by the posterior probabilities of these parameters. So this seems like a very intuitive, natural thing to do. We're not fitting anything. We're just representing our uncertainty. We'll uh, not have to worry about overfitting, and we'll have an automatically calibrated complexity. Uh, the issue with this approach is often this integral isn't exactly tractable for many likelihoods and priors, and sometimes it can be difficult to have intuitions about what sorts of priors we want. But we'll always have uncertainty, and we should try to represent this uncertainty. We can have uncertainty through lack of knowledge or intrinsic uncertainty. For example, uh, radioactive decay is considered to be something intrinsically uncertain. It has uncertainty that we can never really know. Um, I think uncertainty through lack of knowledge can often look like intrinsic uncertainty. For example, if we're rolling dice, it might seem like a 
a uh, good model, the more we roll, to say that uh, there's an equal probability of the dice landing on each side. But in principle, if we could model the strength of the throw, the weighting of the dice, the friction on the table, the wind in the air, that we would be able to exactly predict which side the dice would land on for each throw. It doesn't really matter, though. Even if the world uh, is deterministic and there is some kind of absolute truth, we'll never know all these initial conditions, we'll never have uncertainty, and we can represent this belief using probability distributions, and that really embodies what Bayesian inference is, and although we might not know exactly which prior distri distribution to use, at least we can make sort of an attempt to try and represent this uncertainty, just in the same way we don't know what kind of functional form to use, but we, we try to choose something that might be good. Uh, we have to make assumptions to be able to do inference and predictions, and I think the functional form of a model is just as much of an assumption as an explicit prior distribution on parameters. So this is just uh, a quick review of what we've discussed so far. And now I'll um, give a quick example of something that I think really elucidates the differences between regularization and Bayesian inference. So imagine we're doing density estimation and we have observations drawn from some unknown density function and we use a very simple model. We, we assume that the density is described by a mixture of two Gaussians with uh, these free parameters theta, the weights in the model, the means of the Gaussians and the variances of the Gaussians. Uh, we can write out our likelihood fairly easily and optimize that with respect to the free parameters. In that case, we'll probably overfit. So uh, one of the Gaussians can give probability mass to all of the data points, and then the other Gaussian is free to collapse its variance down to zero and be rewarded with infinitely li infinite likelihood. So it'll place a point mass on one of the data points. This is an example of overfitting. We probably don't think that one of the points is generated from some kind of delta density function. And we can remedy this problem with regularization. So uh, we can write an objective function. We could even use the posterior distribution over these parameters given the data uh, as an objective function. And the uh, log prior could act as a complexity penalty. And uh, this is exactly regularization. Uh, the uh, prior in this case can be used to motivate uh, a regularizer just in the way uh, a probabilistic framework can be used to motivate a loss function. And uh, for the prior to be a, a proper complexity penalty that'll uh, make our predictions reasonable in this case, uh, it will have to go to zero faster than the likelihood goes to infinity uh, as either of these variance parameters or standard deviation parameters go to zero. And this works, and that's fine, uh, but it's very conceptually and practically different from full Bayesian inference. Uh, in the Bayesian inference setting, we have a predictive distribution which is written as uh, an integral, so an infinite combination of different models corresponding to uncountably infinitely different many different settings of the parameters theta. And in that situation, from that perspective, uh, the solution with the delta function is perfectly acceptable because although it might not be the best solution, it's fine if it's one solution and infinitely many other solutions as long as it doesn't have too much posterior probability. Um, this integral is with respect to the posterior distribution over our parameters, which is a proper normalizable distribution, and it won't give infinite probability to this delta function solution. And in fact, we can develop a scheme where we update each component separately. So the restrictions on the prior can be looser as well. It doesn't need to go to zero faster than the likelihood goes to infinity for uh, this pathological set case uh, to make reasonable predictions. Now, I'll briefly discuss model selection, the marginal likelihood, and Occam's razor with a view to kernel learning, which we'll discuss later on in the talk. The marginal likelihood can be interpreted as the probability of a data set, Y, under a given model if we were to randomly sample parameters from that model. So, if, for example, we had a linear function with a few parameters and a distribution over those parameters, and we were to sample from that distribution, we would induce a distribution over linear functions. And random samples of those parameters would give us different straight lines with different slopes and different intercepts. So we would be able to explain data sets that look like straight lines very well, but we wouldn't be able to explain many data sets at all. And that's illustrated in this figure here by the red curve, where we have the horizontal axis representing all possible data sets and the vertical axis representing the marginal likelihood or the evidence of the data under a given model. 
Likewise, if we have some kind of complicated Bayesian neural network, uh, we can imagine if we were sampling parameters in that model, we could generate quite a wide range of data sets. So we'd have some probability for a lot of data sets, but not much probability for any one data set. And we can see that also by just saying this is a normalizable probability distribution. It has to integrate to one. So it's not going to give a lot of likelihood to very many data sets. Now, Occam's razor is, um, says, basically, favor the simplest explanation that fits the data. And uh, let's just give a little practical example of that. So imagine we have uh, a tree. And we see what appears to be a block behind the tree. But maybe if we had x-ray vision, we might notice that it's actually two blocks, or 10 blocks, or 100 blocks. But if we had to guess how many blocks there were, be there were behind the tree without having x-ray vision, we would probably go with one block. And this is just an example of Occam's razor. And I'm going to argue that this is more than just some kind of ad hoc rule of thumb, but it's actually uh, a property of Bayesian inference. Coherent inference, uh, as described by Bayesian probability, automatically embodies Occam's razor quantitatively, regardless of whether we have a prior that favors simple models. So let's actually consider another example now. Imagine we see the sequence minus 1, 3, 7, 11. Does anyone want to guess what might be the next numbers in the sequence? Right. So probably all of us think that 15 and 19 are the next numbers. And if we were to see 15 and 19, we would probably almost certainly think that 23 and 27 would be the next numbers. And we'd be even more confident about that because we'd see more numbers in the sequence. Um, but you know, we could have sort of 19.9, you know, 1043.8 as a solution to this problem as well. We can come up with a polynomial that will fit these points perfectly and will make these predictions. But we intuitively think that this is a lot more reasonable than this. So let's actually calculate that probability quantitatively. So suppose we have these two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, the sequence is an arithmetic progression, add n, where n is an integer. And hypothesis two, the sequence is generated by a cubic polynomial of the form cx cubed plus dx squared plus e. C, D, and E are fractions. So the polynomial that generated this prediction, these predictions uh, is minus 1 over 11x cubed, 9 over 11x squared, plus 23 over 11. So we can write down probability of hypothesis 1, given the data, divided by probability of hypothesis 2, given the data. And that's equal to a ratio of prior odds, hypothesis 1, over probability of hypothesis 2, times a ratio of marginal likelihoods, the probability of data given hypothesis 1, over the probability of the data given hypothesis 2. Now, if we uh, were to think that arithmetic sequences were uh, more natural in this context than polynomials, then that would correspond to a prior bias in favor of hypothesis one. But let's actually just say that uh, our prior is that hypothesis one and hypothesis two are actually equal in probability. So we'll just completely forget about this term and only consider the data dependent terms. So uh, if we want to calculate the probability of the data given hypothesis one, we'll make a few assumptions. So we'll assume that these numbers are between minus 50 and 50, for example. And uh, then we can say the probability of data given hypothesis 1 will be 1 over 101. That's the probability of starting with minus 1 times 1 over 101. The probability that we're adding 4 to each number, so roughly 10 to the minus 4. Now, if we want to calculate probability of the data given hypothesis 2, let's assume these coefficients are fractions. Uh, let's say the numerator is between minus 50 and 50, and the denominator is between 1 and 50. Then uh, we will have 4 times 
1 over 101 times 1 over 50 for the first coefficient because there are four ways to write 1 over 11 in this case, 1 over 11, 2 over 22, 3 over 33, 4 over 44. Squared because it's the same for the next coefficient times 2 times 1 over 1 times 1 over 50 for the next coefficient times 1 over 101 for starting with minus 1. In this case, we get about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 12. Hypothesis 1 is about 40 million times as probable as hypothesis 2, just considering the evidences here, only the data-dependent terms. So now let's consider a specific practical example that we might actually encounter quite often in a machine learning context of using this evidence or this marginal likelihood for model selection. So suppose we have this data that we've observed here. Uh, does anyone have any guess how this data was actually created? So it's just a step function with uh, added Gaussian noise. And suppose we want to model this data with a polynomial, but we aren't quite sure what order of polynomial to use. So this is a very standard situation. The data is outside of the model class, as it almost always is. And we want to choose an appropriate model for this data uh, from a family of models that we're willing to consider. So what we can do is place a prior distribution over all the free parameters in this model. And then individually for each polynomial, uh, f0, f1, f2, integrate away uh, those parameters and calculate the evidence for the marginal likelihood. So let's suppose our prior is the same for all of these parameters. We just use a spherical Gaussian prior and we calculate these evidences. Then we'll get a bar plot that looks exactly like this and, uh, or very much like this. And superficially, it'll be quite pleasing because it says, well, low order models don't have enough flexibility to fit our data. And higher order models, the higher order polynomials will be oscillating like crazy, and they'll just uh, not generalize in a reasonable way. And the marginal likelihood, therefore, is favoring something of intermediate complexity. So it seems quite nice. And this is actually used as an example in many talks and textbooks. Uh, but what they don't tell you is that this plot, which is sometimes called Occam's Hill, is actually the artifact of a bad prior. If we think about the problem a little bit more carefully, we realize that the truth has to be outside of the model class, and we can get much closer to the truth by considering more and more expressive models. For example, the Weierstrass theorem of 1885 says that we can represent uh, any continuous function with arbitrary accuracy on a closed interval with an arbitrarily high order polynomial. And we can go back to this sort of, if you have a simple model, you can make it better by just adding a little bit more detail, a little bit more uh, expressive power in your model. So, if we properly represent our beliefs in such expressive models, we shouldn't overfit, and we can represent our belief that the low-order terms will be more important for explaining the data than the high-order terms by having a prior on the coefficients with a variance that scales with the order of these coefficients. And when we do that and we integrate away the parameters, uh, we end up with something that looks more like this, which you might call Occam's asymptote. And we can even learn this scaling from the data or we can integrate it away. And this is quite exciting because it motivates non-parametric modeling. Uh, it sort of motivates using infinite order models, which is quite fun. If uh, you're interested in reading more about this, uh, there's a paper by Cass and Raftery uh, called Bayes Factors on the sensitivity of ratios of evidences to marginal likelihoods. And there's also a paper by Rasmussen and Garamani called Occam's Razor. Uh, just as a final aside, uh, this plot that we've used of the evidence function versus all possible data sets is a nice way of explaining how there's an Occam's razor effect in Bayesian inference, but uh, it can't always be used to define complexity because we can imagine contriving a model that gave equal probability to all possible data sets and didn't actually learn anything interesting from the data. And intuitively, at least to me, it feels like a complex model should in principle be able to extract a lot of information from the data. And in a slightly different context, uh, Zubin Garamani has discussed uh, using mutual information between the training and the test predictions under a given model uh, to define the information capacity of that model. And this might be an interesting way to motivate model development and to maybe define complexity in a sense. We might also want to consider uh, rates of learning as well in doing this. Now, 
uh, Bayesian non-parametric models have an information capacity that scales with the number of uh, uh, with data points that we have. So uh, the number of meaningful parameters scales with the amount of available information, which seems like a very desirable property. Early on uh, in the summer school, Alex mentioned that we want big models for big data. And uh, therefore, Bayesian non-parametric models seem very suited to big data because they scale uh, their capacity with the amount of information that we have. And I very much agree that we want big models for big data, and that will be a theme later on in the talk, uh, although in principle, if we have a small number of data points, that shouldn't necessarily change our beliefs about the underlying truth that's generated that data set. I've seen arguments that we should therefore build very expressive models for these data sets as well, and perhaps in principle that would fully express our beliefs. However, if we only have three data points, we're not going to be able to extract a lot of structure from the data. Um, so we're probably actually better off using a simple model. It will be easier to manage and train, uh, and the predictions won't be very different necessarily from a very expressive model. But if we have a lot of data points, then sometimes we have this unprecedented opportunity to extract rich structure from the data, a lot of information, and uh, we can fully exploit this by having a very expressive model. So this is just a quick summary of some of the things that we've discussed so far. And soon we'll be discussing how to scale very expressive kernel machines. Finally, and this is related to what I might say to myself if I could go back in time, uh, and I think it really helps us understand uh, what Bayesian model averaging is and what Bayesian model averaging isn't. And it's definitely not a way of doing model combination in the way that ensemble learning is a way of doing model combination. So we've seen a lot of Bayesian model averages so far in this talk. And uh, just for fun and variety, we'll consider a classification context. And in that context, a Bayesian model average answers the following question. Given that all of our data D were generated by exactly one hypothesis, H hat, what is the probability of observing a new input-output pair XC, where C is a class label? So 22 uh, is our Bayesian model average. We again have probabilities of class labels under a hypothesis multiplied by the posterior probability of that hypothesis given the data. It looks very much like a way of combining models, in a sense it is. However, the PHIs given D can be interpreted as soft weights which only represent a statistical inability to distinguish hypotheses given limited data. If one of these models or hypotheses had epsilon less error than any of the other models, with enough data, eventually the model average would collapse onto that hypothesis. So if you actually believe that the truth is some kind of combination of models, then we should include that combination of models in our hypothesis space. Otherwise, the more data you get, the worse the Bayesian model average will perform because you'll be collapsing onto something that's further away from the truth. Tom Minka has a, a fun technical report about this as well. So on to Gaussian processes, which are often thought of as very uh, specialized and advanced machine learning algorithms, but actually we see examples of Gaussian processes everywhere. Even this simple linear function is an example of, of a Gaussian process if we place a Gaussian distribution over the parameters. So this distribution over the parameters induces a distribution over linear functions. Here I basically sampled many times from this standard Gaussian variable conditioned on those samples to draw many different straight lines with different slopes and different intercepts. If you were to average them all together, you get this blue curve, this mean function shown. And 95% uh, of this probability mass uh, will be shown in gray shade. Now we can characterize this induced distribution over functions directly rather than focus too much on the parameters. So we can calculate the expected value. In this case, it's just going to be zero because we've used a zero mean function for these parameters. And we can calculate the covariance between any pair of function values. 1 plus x, b, x, c. And because uh, the function is just a combination of Gaussian variables, marginally, each function value is going to be Gaussian distributed. And any collection of function values will, again, share these base Gaussian variables. It will have a joint Gaussian distribution entirely characterized by the mean function that we derived and the covariance kernel that we derived. And formally, a Gaussian process here is defined as a collection of random variables any finite number of which have a joint Gaussian distribution. We write f is distributed as a GP with mean function m and covariance kernel k to mean that 
any collection of function values has the joint Gaussian distribution with mean vector mu and covariance matrix K built up from the mean function of the Gaussian process and the covariance kernel of the Gaussian process. We can derive the covariance kernel corresponding to a linear basis function model with a Gaussian distribution over the parameters in a similar way. Uh, the expected value in this case will be zero, just because we've chosen a zero mean for this prior over parameters, just for notational simplicity. Uh, we, this prior has an arbitrary covariance matrix, and the covariance kernel of this Gaussian process just looks like an inner product of these basis functions that we have evaluated at a pair of input points. It's quite nice that the entire basis function model of equations 37 and 38, which is quite general, can be entirely encapsulated as a distribution over functions with a mean function and a covariance kernel. And we probably have more intuitions about the functions that fit our data than we do about the parameters in a parametric model. And we can control these intuitions, whether we think the data are going to be periodic, smooth, follow some kind of Brownian motion, by choosing an appropriate kernel. In other words, the kernel controls the support and the inductive biases of our model, and therefore its ability to generalize. Now let's consider some examples of popular kernels. The RBF kernel, often called the squared exponential kernel or the Gaussian kernel, is far and above the most popular kernel used with Gaussian processes and other kernel machines. It expresses the very natural intuition that function values, functions, in this case in quotation marks, um, are more correlated at nearby inputs than function values evaluated at far away inputs. The hyperparameters, A and L in this case, control the scale of these functions and how quickly they vary with the inputs, how wiggly they are. Gaussian processes with this kernel have large support and a lot of good theoretical properties. They're universal approximators, for instance. Now, let's consider a concrete, concrete example of how we'd actually query a Gaussian process with an RBF kernel at a finite number of points. So we can't actually represent this function at all points in the input domain. That would require infinite memory. But we can choose a certain number of input points. This is just simple MATLAB code, in this case from minus 10 to 10, increments of 0.2 apart. We want to build up our covariance matrix by evaluating the RBF kernel at every pair of inputs. This is a very inefficient way of doing it, but it's just for clarity. We could actually vectorize this and make it a lot faster in MATLAB. Now, our goal is to sample from a Gaussian distribution with this covariance matrix K. Now, practically to do that, we might need to add a little bit to the diagonal of K because it might be poorly conditioned. And uh, we can then take the Cholesky decomposition and just multiply that by a spherical Gaussian variable. So basically, uh, in this case, we can write um, our function. So our function is, this is a vector of GP function values. It's distributed as n, 0, k. And we can write that as uh, the Cholesky decomposition of k times a vector nu, where nu is just n, 0, i. So nu is just a spherical Gaussian variable, and L, L transpose equals k. And when we plot what we've done there, we get the black dots that you see in this figure. And I sampled from that Gaussian distribution two more times to get the purple curve and the green curve, and I've just joined the dots together in that case. If I were to sample infinitely many functions and average them all together, we'd get this blue curve, this mean function, and the gray shade shows uh, where 95% of these functions will be contained. Now, we said that the kernel had hyperparameters, like the length scale hyperparameter. That will control how wiggly these functions appear, how quickly they vary as a function of the input space. This is uh, a picture of a RBF kernel in one dimension for one dimensional inputs. The horizontal axis measures distance between pairs of inputs in the input space. So a long length scale will give you more correlations for faraway inputs. This is how we might visualize a covariance matrix built up from an RBF kernel, again, for one-dimensional inputs that are ordered. Function values evaluated at the same inputs are most correlated along the diagonal, and then you get uh, decreasing correlations as we move towards the off-diagonals. Now, 
let's try and make predictions with this model that we've defined. Basically, we've defined a prior over functions with properties controlled by the kernel. We've observed some data now denoted by this y vector at input locations x. We want to infer the Gaussian process evaluated at our test endpoints x star. So we can write down the joint distribution of uh, our data and our Gaussian process evaluated at the test inputs. The distribution of the data is just going to be equal to our Gaussian process evaluated at the training inputs plus some variable nu, where nu is n0 sigma squared i. So py just equals n0 k plus sigma squared i. The distribution of the test points is just uh, a Gaussian variable with uh, a covariance matrix built up from our covariance kernel evaluated at the test inputs. And the off diagonals here are just the cross covariances between the training and the test points. So this, the capital K is actually a matrix. So the entries here are actually matrices. And they greatly depend on the kernel hyperparameters theta, which could be length scale, for example. And just using standard Gaussian identities, we can then derive the conditional distribution of F star given our data Y and these hyperparameters theta. Now, does anyone actually notice anything unusual about the predictive covariances? Something different about the predictive uncertainty, the predictive covariances than we have in the predictive mean function in equation 48? Hmm? Exactly. Uh, the predictive mean depends on the observations. That would be really scary if it didn't. Um, the predictive variances, our predictive uncertainty, and our predictive covariances only depend on the distance between our training point and the, te the, the uh, test point, our training points and the test point, uh, which is uh, on the one hand desirable. If we get far away from the data set, we might be more uncertain. But on the other hand, if, if our data is oscillating like crazy, we should also account for that somehow and have greater predictive uncertainty. So it's a bit strange that, that, that the data doesn't actually appear, up, appear in the predictive covariances when we do inference. When we learn the hyperparameters of the model, like the noise variance and uh, the scale of the kernel, for example, then this covariance matrix is implicitly conditioned on the data, in which case we will account for, for example, oscillations in the data points. But uh, if you want to be more advanced, you could actually, for example, uh, place a distribution over the scale parameter of a kernel, integrated away analytically in some cases, for example, if you have in, an inverse gamma distribution, and then you'll derive a student T process, and you can figure out the analytic moments of that process, and the predictive covariances in that case will actually explicitly depend on the data, which is nice. So imagine we've seen some data points denoted by crosses on the right, and we want to model uh, these data by a Gaussian process, so we'll Choose a GP, use an RBF kernel, say, uh, choose values for the hyperparameters A0 and L0. And uh, just to get a sense of this model, we might want to sample from the prior on the left. And on the right, I've shown the predictive mean function in blue, the uh, uh, two times the predictive standard deviations in the gray shade, so 95% of the posterior predictive mass. But this doesn't really seem quite right to me. Can anyone see anything that, again, seems a little bit strange about this fits the data? Basically, these functions, to me, look too complex. They're wiggling all over the place. The rate of variation is far too great. And that's because we've chosen a bad value for the length scale parameter. This length scale greatly affects the quality of our predictions. If we make it a lot bigger, then we might get predictions that look like this, which might look overly smooth, overly simple. So it would be nice to try and tune this parameter automatically, and we can do that through the marginal likelihood. We can 
again, go back to this figure and imagine if we have a very short length scale, we have these functions that are wiggling all over the place, but they can fit all sorts of data sets perfectly, but they won't be able to explain many data sets very well. And likewise, if we have a very big length scale, we uh, will only be able to explain a few data sets quite well. The marginal likelihood will favor uh, a solution for the length scale and other hyperparameters that has an appropriate level of complexity. And uh, the green curve here is the predictive mean that we get if we learn the length scale of the data from the marginal likelihood where we've integrated away the Gaussian process. And if we assume a Gaussian noise model, and we'll talk about relaxing that assumption later, we can analytically integrate away the Gaussian process and express the marginal likelihood as we've done in equation 53. It pleasingly compartmentalizes into a model fit term and a complexity penalty, which is automatically calibrated and quite different from a complexity penalty that we might get, for example, through regularization. This provides, I think, a very powerful mechanism for kernel learning. It's something that's fairly special about Gaussian processes and might actually distinguish Gaussian processes more in the future when we develop more expressive covariance functions with many, many hyperparameters to learn. So we can optimize this objective function with respect to theta to tune our parameters. Uh, that's not uh, a fully Bayesian procedure. We could also try and integrate away these hyperparameters. Unfortunately, the integral we need to do is intractable, so we'd have to re resort to sampling, for instance. And uh, I haven't seen this done very much. Often the marginal likelihood works quite well, and you can regularize that marginal likelihood if you want to. Uh, but I, I do see this done in specific applications like Bayesian optimization, where predictive uncertainty is extremely important. And uh, Nando mentioned how Bayesian optimization can be used to tune the parameters in a deep neural network, for example. So that's one way you can actually use these Gaussian process models uh, as uh, a part of uh, a very different type of model. So let's actually carefully define what a kernel is now. In the most general terms possible, a kernel is a function k which maps a pair of arguments from an arbitrary input space into the real line. For a kernel to be a so-called valid kernel, this kernel has to be real and correspond to an inner product of basis functions or sometimes called uh, a feature map. From this, it follows that k is symmetric and we can also prove that it's a necessary and sufficient condition that a kernel matrix created by k will be positive semi-definite. And this is something we can prove. Informally, a kernel describes the similarities between pairs of data points. For example, faraway points might be less correlated than nearby points. It also tells us the overlap between features or basis functions. We've seen that all linear basis function models correspond to a Gaussian process with uh, a particular kernel, as, as long as we have a distribution on the parameters in these linear basis function models. And we've gotten some experience with the RBF kernel, and we've seen how the kernel can control the generalization behavior of a kernel machine like a Gaussian processes. What kinds of functions are a priori probable? So let's consider a potential kernel here. This basically says that a pair of inputs, x and x prime, uh, uh, will have a kernel value of one if x and x prime are less than one unit apart in distance and zero otherwise. This is uh, an example from Alex Smola. This kernel is symmetric. It provides information about proximity of points. And I want you to tell me whether you think it's a valid kernel or at least how you might go about trying to figure out whether this is a valid kernel. So we can actually try some points. We can uh, imagine that we have points x1, x2, and x3, and we can try and compute this matrix. So uh, this first point, x1, will be a unit one apart from x2, a unit one apart, less than a unit one apart from itself, and two units apart from x3. So we'll have one, one, zero in the first row, and we can compute the rest of the rows in the same kind of way. And we can compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. One of the eigenvalues is negative. This is not a positive definite matrix, uh, it's not a valid kernel. The representer theorem says that a decision function f of x, so so far we've been considering f of x as a Gaussian process, but we can be more general. We can consider a decision function f of x uh, 
which uh, is written as a linear basis function model, can be expressed as a sum of a kernel centered on all the input points times these coefficients, alpha i. This is initially viewed as a, a strength of kernel methods because uh, the dimensionality of these basis functions phi uh, could be arbitrarily large. So in a way, that's quite incredible. We can work with these models that we normally wouldn't be able to work with, with finite amount of computational power, just using the kernel trick by uh, using this dual representation in terms of kernels. Fortunately, the, nums, the number of non-zero alpha i often grow linearly in the size of the training set n. Uh, for a concrete example, in GP regression, the alpha i's uh, would be our covariance matrix k plus uh, this diagonal term that we've added for noise, inverted times our vector of data points y. And there are many ways we can make new valid kernels from no invalid kernels. We can multiply kernels together. We can add them together. We can exponentiate them. We can multiply each side of a kernel by a function acting on each of the inputs in the pair of inputs. Stationary kernels are very popular. They correspond to kernels which are invariant to translations in the input space. So they can be written as a difference of our inputs, x and x prime. They're a function of tau, which is just equal to x minus x prime. All distance kernels, like the RBF kernel, are examples of stationary kernels. Uh, polynomial kernels, a uh, GP with a polynomial kernel will correspond to a distribution where polynomial functions is an example of a non-stationary kernel. Stationarity is good in a lot of cases because it provides us with a useful inductive bias. And we'll actually use that quite a lot later when we're building various types of kernel functions. Bogner's theorem specifies a deterministic relationship between a stationary kernel and its spectral density. And this is nice because we might have more intuitions about spectral densities than we do about stationary kernels. And we can actually use this to try and derive various kernels and understand them. So let's imagine we want to derive the RBF kernel. So we'll start by placing Gaussian bumps along the real line. And we'll center these Gaussian bumps on the points CI. From the previous slides, we know that the kernel of this model will correspond to equation, equation 78. And now let's suppose we want to uh, have the distance between these bumps correspond to 1 over j, where j is the number of basis functions in our model. We let that approach infinity. Then the kernel in equation 80 will become a Riemann sum. And if we want to distribute these basis functions all across the re real line, we can let the limits of this integral go from minus infinity to infinity. And we recover the RBF kernel, which to me is actually quite magical because we're using this model, which has an incredible amount of represent representational power. It's, a, it's an infinite model, but with finite amounts of computation because we've gone into this dual kernel representation. So this is very powerful in my opinion. And we can likewise derive all sorts of other kernels. We can uh, derive the polynomial kernel by taking products of linear kernels. We can derive a kernel that varies on multiple scales. So we might imagine that our data is actually generated by a combination of different underlying processes that are varying at different scales. For example, the returns on equity indices are thought to have correlations that vary over a scale of about two weeks and of about two months. So you might, in that case, want to use a mixture of two RBF kernels. But if you're not sure how many scales will be in the data, you might even want to uh, consider a scale mixture of RBF kernels, which is how the rational quadratic kernel is derived. The uh, density function here to derive the rational quadratic kernel is chosen to be a gamma density. If we chose a different density function, then we could drive another kernel, which might be interesting. On the right, I've shown samples from a Gaussian process with a rational quadratic kernel. We can see that it seems to be varying on different scales. And it's, uh, these, these samples behave very differently than samples from a GP with an RBF kernel. And on the left, I've tried to visualize this kernel in uh, one dimension where the horizontal axis tau corresponds to a distance between our input points for different values of alpha, which essentially will control the tails of this kernel. 
The neural network kernel is quite famous because uh, it triggered a lot of research on Gaussian processes after it was derived by Radford Neal in 1996. Radford at the time was working on inference in large Bayesian neural networks and he was arguing that we should use very expressive models so it was very natural for him to pursue the limit of large networks and take the number of hidden units and let, let it approach infinity and if we consider uh, a neural network with one hidden layer here in equation 93 and we have uh, relatively loose restrictions on the activation functions h on the hidden units uh, the ui weights and uh, the weights from the uh, hidden units to the outputs, V, and we invoke the central limit theorem, we can actually show that F will have uh, a joint Gaussian distribution if we evaluate it at an arbitrary set of inputs, and we can actually derive what the covariance function for this Gaussian process will be. If we choose, for example, an error function as our transfer function, then we get a covariance function that looks like equation 98. And if we choose sigma to be diag diagonal uh, with uh, different settings of parameters here, 10, 3, and 1, draws from a Gaussian process with this neural network kernel look as follows. So they're uh, very non-stationary. We can see it's, the function is behaving quite differently in the center here than it does on the edges. In a way, we can uh, loosely define a stationary function by saying that its behavior is sort of similar no matter where, where we are in the input space. Now, we might actually want a kernel with an input-dependent length scale. Naively, we might then want to do something where we let this L parameter actually be a function of the inputs. But uh, most ways we do that will break the kernel, will not result in a positive definite kernel. Gibbs derived a kernel that does have this property. And on the left, I've shown a length scale function. And on the right, I've shown GPs drawn from a Gibbs kernel uh, drawn with a Gibbs kernel using that length scale function, we can see that they're varying more quickly in the center where the length scale goes down. By the way, we clearly want a positive definite kernel when we're using a Gaussian process because the covariance matrix of a Gaussian distribution has to be positive definite. There are lots of other ways to derive interesting kernels. We could, for example, transform our inputs x to some vector u, uh, which is equal to cos x, sine x, pass that vector u through an RBF kernel and then derive a periodic kernel, which can be used with the Gaussian process as a distribution over periodic functions. On the left, I've shown an example of a periodic kernel and a draw from a GP with that periodic kernel. So as we've said, stationary kernels are invariant to translations in the input space. But sometimes non-stationarity is very useful to encapsulate in a kernel function. So let's think about how we might actually want to derive other types of non-stationary kernels. So imagine we actually had a non-stationary function that looked like this. You can imagine creating a function that looks like this just by taking something like a sine curve and then transforming the inputs in some way. So if I actually warp the inputs by uh, x squared in this case, I can actually change the picture in the left into something that looks more like a normal sine curve, and then we can model that with a stationary kernel, for instance. In other words, we can actually, instead of passing x and x prime into our kernel, or RBF kernel, or whatever it might be, we can actually transform the, the inputs with some function g, and that function could even be parameterized, and those parameters would fall out into the marginal likelihood, and we can learn those parameters as part of training when we create our non-stationary kernel. And this is actually very useful. It's something that's recently been done with Bayesian optimization for training deep nets and was found to really help improve performance. Now this is another type of non-stationarity. It basically looks like a periodic function that's been amplitude modulated in some way. We see this kind of behavior, for example, in natural sounds. And Again, we can create a valid kernel by multiplying our function, which is a GP in this case, by some kind of amplitude function. And the kernel corresponding to that new GP will just be AX, KXX prime, AX prime, where AX is our amplitude modulator. That is, if we condition on the value of, of uh, A of X, so if AX is deterministic, we can um, 
even combine all sorts of GPs together that are modulated in this way. So if we had this model here, W1 of x, F1 of x plus W2 of x, F2 of x, and F1 and F2 are GPs with different kernels, you can imagine what might happen. We, uh, in this case, could be going from regions of, for example, Brownian motion covariance structure to periodic covariances to some kind of mixture back to some kind of smooth covariant structure if we had more terms in the mixture. We can get very easily things like non-parametric, non-stationary length scales. We can imagine even W1 and W2 are actually Gaussian processes as well. Uh, so we can induce a very expressive non-stationary kernel by forming these kinds of combinations. And we could even play around with this a little bit more and pass these weight functions through a sigmoid function, a logistic sigmoid, for example, and that would make these changes in covariant structure more discrete. So now we can get chain point, change points in our model, for example. Now, although the RBF kernel is very popular, it's often criticized for being uh, overly smooth. Functions uh, from a GP drawn with an RBF kernel uh, will be infinitely differentiable. So it's interesting to think about how we might try and create a drop-in replacement which retains many of the useful biases of an RBF kernel, like that uh, function values at nearby, nearby inputs will be more correlated than function values at faraway inputs. So a very sort of naive thing to try would be, okay, well, what happens if we replace the squared distance measure with an absolute value distance measure? Uh, there should actually be a minus sign there. Um, and if we do that, it turns out we do get a valid kernel called the ornstein ollenbeck kernel. A GP with an OU kernel corresponds to the velocity of a particle undergoing Brownian motion. And I'll just show a draw from a GP with an OU kernel. You can see that even though the OU kernel and the RBF kernel have the same length scale in this case, the behavior of the GPs with each of these kernels is very, very different. The uh, sample from a GP with an OU kernel looks a lot less smooth. We can drive actually a more general family of kernels called the Matirin kernel by modeling the spectral density with a T distribution. So recall that the, the spectral density of a Gaussian kernel is just a Gaussian. If we Fourier transform an RBF kernel, we get a Gaussian centered at the origin. This suggests that maybe we could use a T distribution centered at the origin, take the inverse Fourier transform and derive another interesting closed form expression for a kernel. And that kernel happens to be the Matirin kernel, which has lots of nice properties. It's finitely differentiable uh, when uh, the degrees of freedom nu uh, have uh, plus a half equal p for some natural number p. The corresponding gp corresponds to a continuous time ARP process. By setting nu equals one, we recover the OU kernel. Uh, the authors of Fast Food pointed out something very interesting that in high dimensions, the RBF kernel has this concentration of measure effect, which makes it not very effective. And the Matirin kernel suffers from this problem to uh, much less of an extent. So it's worth looking at that in the paper. It's also worth noting that this kernel gives rise to a Markovian process. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that means function values uh, will be independent, conditioned on a certain number of values in between. So the uh, graphical model corresponding to a Gaussian process with a Markovian kernel has this kind of Markovian structure. And we can actually apply classical filtering and smoothing algorithms to make exactly the same predictions we would make normally using the sort of Cholesky decomposition way of doing inference, but just a lot more efficiently. So we've considered all sorts of different kernels. And now I'd like to ask whether we think all Gaussian processes are Bayesian non-parametric models. On the surface, it might seem like they are, because in a way, we've replaced parameters with function values, for example. And the number of relevant function values increases as we get more and more data points. But actually, if the uh, GP has a kernel which corresponds to a finite basis function expansion, those function values will be highly constrained. For example, if it has a linear kernel, all we need to do is you know, know two function values to say what all the other ones are going to be. So. I think for a Gaussian process to be truly non-parametric, we have to require that a function evaluated at a particular input, f of xi, given any arbitrary collection of other function values, f not i here, has to be free to take any value in the real line. And for that freedom to be possible, it is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the kernel to be derived from an infinite basis function expansion. So non-parametric kernels will allow us 
a great amount of flexibility and will give us this property that the information capacity of our Gaussian process will actually grow with the amount of available data. And I think it's quite informative to consider the differences between, for example, a non-parametric RBF kernel and a finite dimensional analog. So suppose, for instance, that we see three data points which are denoted by crosses and we model this by a finite basis function model. So we'll put uh, Gaussian bumps centered on each of these three points. We can put uh, a Gaussian prior over the coefficient, so this will be a Gaussian process. And now suppose we want to make predictions far away from the data, say at uh, x equals 7 in this case. This model will predict something very close to 0. It's very far away from the data if our prior on the coefficients is 0. But it'll also be very confident in its predictions. In fact, the confidence in its predictions will actually increase the further we get away from the data, which is actually quite pathological behavior. But if we actually had an infinite basis function model, so if we had a GP corresponding to an RBF kernel, our uncertainty will be very great far away from the data. It'll increase as we get farther away because we actually have Gaussian bumps densely dispersed everywhere across the real line. So this is an example where actually going non-parametric remedies the pathological behavior of a parametric analog. And again, I think it's quite incredible that we can actually use these models with infinite numbers of basis functions and retain computational tractability. So discrete time autoregressive models are also Gaussian processes quite often, uh, but they're just not often called Gaussian processes. You could even have sort of a simple symmetric random walk and you would get a Gaussian process. And these sorts of models are often applied in econometrics and in natural sound modeling, for example. And the covariance functions corresponding to these Gaussian processes are actually sometimes quite different from the kernels or covariance functions that we use in continuous time modeling. Very interestingly, a lot of them allow for negative correlations, even if they're stationary. And a lot of stationary kernels that we commonly use in continuous Gaussian process modeling are everywhere positive. And we can imagine that negative correlations will be very important for actually describing a wide range of data sets. Even linear trends have long range negative covariances. Let's talk about scaling up Gaussian processes and kernel methods now. So recall that Gaussian process inference required evaluating k inverse times y or solving a linear system where k is an n by n covariance matrix if we have n data points and y is an n by one vector of data points. Marginal likelihood evaluations, which are used for learning kernel hyperparameters, also require that we evaluate the log determinant of k. Naively, both of these operations will cost n cubed for n data points and n squared memory. Typically, people use the Cholesky decomposition of k to solve these linear systems and to compute the log determinant. This limits Gaussian process inference to about n equals 10,000 data points in practice. And if we're doing a reasonable amount of kernel learning, perhaps n equals 2,000 data points would be a reasonable upper limit on what we can handle. Perhaps the most popular approach to scaling up standard Gaussian processes is to introduce what are called inducing inputs. So imagine we have our Gaussian process vector f and our Gaussian process vector f star evaluated respectively at n training points and j testing points, we can always introduce some inducing points u and say that uh, they're Gaussian with some covariance matrix k u u. And just using the sum rule of probability, we can integrate away these points and recover our joint distribution over f star and f. Now, all inducing input approaches make the assumption that f and f star are conditionally independent given these variables u. And under this assumption, we can write our predictive equations as in, equa as in 115 and 116, where now we're working with a much smaller covariance matrix, KUU, and the cost of our predictions is actually reduced from order n cubed to order m squared n operations, where m is chosen to be much less than n. Now, these inducing points could be uh, at the same inputs as our training locations, or we could even optimize their locations uh, using the marginal likelihood. The different inducing input approaches that we have correspond to different additional assumptions about these conditional distributions, QF given U and QF star given U. Uh, FITC, PITC, DTC are all different examples of popular inducing input approaches. And for further reading, uh, there's a great review article, uh, which I've referenced here and at the end of the talk. 
These methods allow us to go from maybe 10,000 points to about 50,000 points in practice. And they work very, very well with popular kernel methods. But uh, as we'll see in part two, they actually don't work as well when we have very expressive kernels that we want to scale up to large data sets. These assumptions are not well suited to very flexible kernel learning. In that case, we often need to do something different. So I said that in standard Gaussian process, inference and learning, we take the Cholesky decomposition, and this is really the computational and storage bottleneck. But doing that basically ignores a huge amount of structure, which will inevitably be in this covariance matrix. The kernel has to have some kind of structure, some kind of inductive biases for us to make reasonable generalizations. And it seems possible that we should be able to exploit those inductive biases to greatly speed up inference predictions and learning without any loss in predictive accuracy. And we can actually often do that. Toplitz methods are an example of this. So suppose K is stationary and our inputs are on a regularly spaced 1D grid. This might seem very restrictive, but it actually applies to a lot of time series examples. Then the resulting covariance matrix will be toplets, which means we have, for example, K0 on the May diagonal, K1 on the next off diagonal, and so on. So the diagonals are all different from one another, but same, the same, uh, the, uh, each diagonal will have the same entries. This covariance matrix is clearly highly structured, and we can exploit this structure to speed up inference and predictions and make exactly the same kinds of predictions as we would make if we were to do the Cholesky decomposition and follow standard procedures. And we can speed things up by embedding this toplets covariance matrix in the top left into a larger circulant matrix. And I've done that just by wrapping the first column of this toplets matrix in on itself. And uh, circulant matrices have the property that every column is shifted a position from the next column. So all of the information in this circulant matrix is contained in the first column. And that'll be very important. Now we can write down the standard equations to solve for the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the circulant matrix and translate those equations into a set of n difference equations and treat these difference equations sort of like we treat a differential equation in that we guess a solution for the problem and verify the solution. And when we do that, we can actually show that the eigenvalues of this circulant matrix equal the discrete Fourier transform of the first column. And we can also show uh, that we can take a matrix vector product, C, where C is our circulant matrix and Z is some kind of arbitrary vector, by first taking the discrete Fourier transform of the first column of our circulant matrix and the discrete Fourier transform of this vector, and then applying the inverse discrete Fourier transform to the product. And this is very nice because we can use fast Fourier transforms to do discrete Fourier transforms very quickly. But we're not directly interested in C times Z. We're interested in, in our covariance matrix, for example, times our data. So we can make a big vector and put the uh, uh, parts of the vector that we're interested in at the beginning. So for example, our data vector, our weight vector W, and pad the rest with zeros, multiply it by a circulant matrix, and the first part of the result will just be our toplets matrix times this weight vector or times the data. So basically, we've developed a fast way of getting toplets matrix vector products. We can do that in n log n instead of n squared. And now we can use iterative solvers for linear systems like preconditioned conjugate gradients to compute, for example, k inverse times y. These iterative solvers only use matrix vector products. And we're guaranteed an exact solution in n iterations, but in practice, for a convergence to within machine precision, often we only need a few iterations. And the number of iterations we need for that convergence depends a lot more on the conditioning of the covariance matrix than the actual number of data points we have. So we've now reduced inference and predictions to n log n from n cubed. So this is a great improvement in efficiency, and we're not really paying for doing that either. And this actually gives rise to the question, well, should we always use some kind of iterative method like preconditioned conjugate gradients to solve inverse matrix vector products. And I think the answer would often be yes, especially if you uh, can uh, multiply a matrix with a vector in faster than n squared operations, because then you're 
guaranteed a solution in faster than enqueued operations. And this also suggests a way of developing new efficient methods, like if we can consider sparse covariance matrix for, matrices, for example, that we can multiply with vectors in faster than n squared, then we've automatically got a very scalable way to use uh, the corresponding kernel method. Unfortunately, computing log determinant k uh, can't be done in n log n operations, but it can be done in n squared operations using Toeplitz methods. In the next lecture, we'll consider a different way of exploiting structure. Uh, we'll consider a tensor decomposition of the covariance matrix, which can often be applied with uh, perhaps relatively loose conditions. And again, will allow us to make uh, exact predictions very, very efficiently. So we can reduce problems that might normally correspond to a million data points basically to a thousand data points by using these tensor decompositions and uh, taking, the, taking the eigen decompositions of the uh, individual matrices in this tensor decomposition. Now, a couple slides ago, we showed that the, uh, if we have a GP with a circulant matrix and we transform the data, then we can model that transformed or Fourier transformed data with a GP that has a diagonal matrix in this frequency domain. And the covariance matrix will basically just be uh, equal to a diagonal matrix with entries that are equal to the uh, Fourier transform of the first column of the circulant matrix. We can write down uh, the marginal likelihood for uh, this GP and actually optimize that with respect to this circulant kernel, CM, in the frequency space to derive what's called uh, the empirical spectral density of the data. And that's actually quite useful. Uh, it can be used to uh, compare with the spectral density that we get when we uh, use various kernels and actually can be used as a way to initialize the spectral density of a model if we're actually doing spectral density estimation. And uh, if we take the uh, inverse Fourier transform of this, we should be able to derive uh, an empirical covariance estimate as well. Another way of exploiting structure uh, can be uh, applied if our kernel corresponds to, uh, if a GP with a kernel corresponds to a Markovian process, as I've mentioned briefly. Uh, I don't have time to discuss this in too much detail, but details uh, can be found in a PhD thesis by Eunice Satchi, which I've referenced at the end of this talk. Basically, uh, if we have a GP with a so-called Markovian kernel, a uh, Mathieran kernel is an example of that, then we can express it as the solution to a system of stochastic differential equations, and we can apply classical filtering and smoothing algorithms to the system of differential equations, again now for linear inference in learning and no loss in predictive accuracy. And I think these structure exploiting approaches are, I mean, generally very, very new in the context of Gaussian process regression, but very, very promising when we have an expressive covariance function. So if we're doing a lot of kernel learning, because we're not making a lot of additional assumptions, we're just exploiting the existing structure in the model to scale things up. So uh, we can categorize scalable approaches into three families of approaches, inducing input approaches. Uh, this would include models, FITC, DTC, and PTC, structure exploiting approaches. We briefly discussed three examples of those, and we'll go a lot more into Kronecker methods in the next talk and finite basis function methods, where we use a finite number of basis functions to approximate a non-parametric kernel. This is a summary of some of the kernels we've discussed. We'll introduce the spectral mixture kernel in the next lecture. Uh, this just classifies the kernels as stationary or non-stationary. Notice that almost all the stationary kernels here are strictly positive, which is sort of interesting. Now let's consider a worked example. Suppose we've observed these uh, CO2 concentration measurements, measured monthly, and we want to be able to extrapolate on this problem. So let's carefully consider various patterns in the data and choose appropriate kernels to model those patterns. So the dash blue curve on the left corresponds to the long-term rising trend. The green curve corresponds to an intermediate trend. We can see that that's kind of multi-scale, so we might want to model that sort of intermediate trend with a rational quadratic kernel, for example, which can handle multi-scale data. 
we might want to choose a squared exponential kernel, or a, a, aka an RBF kernel, for the long-term rising trend. You might say, well, why not a linear function or something? And that might be OK, but it would constrain us to always saying that the concentrations will increase forever. And that's something we probably don't want to do. On the right, I show a seasonal trend, which looks sort of quasi-periodic. You can see the amplitudes are increasing over time. So we can choose kernels to model uh, all of these trends that we see in the data, and particularly the quasi-periodic seasonal changes can be modeled as uh, an RBF kernel times a periodic kernel. We have a few free parameters, but we've constrained the periodic kernel to have a period of about a year, for example. We can model uh, our noise as a uh, delta function for the additive noise, and then we can have a correlated noise component that we model with an RBF covariance function. You might say that you know, there's degeneracy between our kernel K4 and our kernel K1, and that's exactly right. Hopefully, the amplitude parameter of kernel 1, theta 1, will be learned to a much larger value than the amplitude parameter of the correlated noise. And these can interchange roles, and that's fine. And we can just check what happens after we train our hyperparameters. So we can sum all these kernels together and model the data using a GP with these kernels. We can interpret some of the learned hyperparameters to tell us interesting things about the data. And then we can perform this extrapolation. So what we've done is we've handcrafted a kernel combination to perform extrapolation. Confidence in the extrapolation appears to be high, which might suggest the model is well specified. But in doing this, basically, the human has done all the interesting pattern recognition. We've used GPs as a very expressive statistical tool. But in principle, whatever we've done should be able to be written down algorithmically and automated on a computer, or at least automated as part of some kind of kernel learning procedure. And that's what we'll focus on in the next talk. In summary, Gaussian processes provide a powerful probabilistic framework for kernel learning. They give us this marginal likelihood. There are, however, there are uh, lots of ways of training kernel hyperparameters that have been introduced outside of the Gaussian process literature as well. Multiple kernel learning is very interesting. It focuses on uh, learning combinations of kernels, typically RBF kernels with different length scales. And often, it's crafted for doing things like uncovering low dimensional structure and high dimensional data. It isn't often used for really flexible kernel learning. It's tailored to specific applications. Uh, there's an interesting and quite comprehensive review article provided in the references. Now, so far, I've mostly talked about Gaussian processes. But Gaussian processes at present aren't the most popular kernel machine. And there are a lot of other popular kernel methods. And kernel density estimation is among these methods. So let's imagine we're doing uh, density estimation. We've changed notation. So x's are our free parameters. They're drawn from some unknown density p of x. If we wanted, we could perform an empirical density estimate. So we could put a delta function spike at every observation. But if we saw different observations, then we get a very different density estimate. So we're probably going to sort of overfit by doing this. So instead, we can smear out this empirical density estimate by convolving it with a kernel, kxx prime. And in that case, our estimate for the true density, p of x, will take the form as a sum here, where we have a kernel centered on all of the data points. This is an example of such a kernel density estimate where we have a true density and the estimate provided in blue and the data points in green. We can see that it's quite a flexible estimate. And in this case, it looks quite accurate. The estimates will change depending on what kernel we use and the hyperparameters of that kernel. So here we're using a width parameter, which is the uh, inverse of a length scale parameter. You can see that the Laplace kernel, which is the same as the OU kernel, uh, provides a reasonable solution here, but it looks less smooth than the solution used uh, derived with the Gaussian kernel or the RBF kernel. If we make the bandwidth very large, or equivalently the length scale very small, the solution starts getting really jittery. Uh, it starts looking more and more like that empirical estimate, which suggests we really want a nice way to tune this kernel hyperparameter. And although in this case we can't use marginal likelihood, we can use cross-validation. So we can use leave one out cross-validation, choose a kernel width that gives us good performance on our validation set. And when we do that, we get an answer that looks like this here, which is quite appropriate. It's less smooth than uh, a Gaussian kernel. 
But in terms of performance, I would say uh, if we were comparing between Gaussian Laplace kernels, the hyperparameters are going to be a lot more important than you know, the specific functional form of that kernel. So I'll describe support vector machines in the uh, beginning of the next lecture, but uh, before I do that, I'll describe Gaussian processes with non-Gaussian likelihoods. So, so far we've considered this observation model, y of x, distributed as a Gaussian, some mean f of x, and some noise variance sigma squared, and f is distributed as a GP. But suppose we want to do classification where this isn't true. In that case, we might want an observation model that says, for example, our class label y of x equals a logistic sigmoid transformation of f of x, and uh, sorry, the probability of y of x equals a logistic sigmoid transformation of f of x. And if we do that, so this is y of x given our Gaussian process f of x. If we do that, then the likelihood of the data isn't going to be Gaussian anymore. So if we try and write down our predictive distribution, we won't be able to compute the relevant integrals. And so we'll have to resort to either sampling or deterministic approximations. So this is our posterior. It's not going to be Gaussian. This is the predictive distribution given our Gaussian process that will be Gaussian. So a sampling approach would be, for example, elliptical slice sampling, which is specifically designed to sample from multivariate Gaussian distributions with highly correlated priors. So it's perfect for Gaussian processes. It exploits the structure in the covariance matrix that we have for F. Uh, this is a paper at uh, AI Stats in 2010 called Elliptical Slice Sampling by Ian Murray, Ryan Adams, and David Mackay. But we're still left with the problem of learning kernel hyperparameters. Before, we had an analytic marginal likelihood. And I'm not sure if this has actually been well solved by sampling yet. I mean, a very intuitive, simple thing to do would be to say, OK, well, we can infer the Fs given our data Y using elliptical slice sampling. And this distribution will be conditioned on our kernel hyperparameters theta. And then we can do a Gibbs cycle where we then sample from the posterior over our hyperparameters, in this case conditioned on our Gaussian process F. using our favorite sampling method, for example, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or slice sampling. The issue with this approach is that the Gaussian process function values f and the kernel hyperparameters are extremely correlated. So if we have one value for theta and then we sample f, it's good, f is going to look very different than if we sampled it for a different value of theta. So this, this skip cycle here will actually mix very, very poorly. And there are various approaches to addressing this, but in general, it's a very hard problem. It really, really helps to have some kind of analytic expression for a marginal likelihood, or at least a decent approximation to the marginal likelihood. So another approach would be, for example, to approximate this distribution, PF given Y, as a Gaussian. And probably one of the simplest ways to do that is to use what's called the Laplace approximation, where we uh, assume PFY is a Gaussian that's centered on the map value for F. So if we optimize this posterior distribution with respect to F, center it, center it on there. And uh, this can be used in Gaussian process classification, for example, and you'll get reasonable results. And it can be 
also applied quite naturally in a lot of other settings, although uh, determining this, uh, the location of the posterior very efficiently often requires Newton's method, and we can only apply that if our likelihood is log concave, and so it's also somewhat restricted. Variational methods for approximate inference are a lot more robust in that sense. They're more difficult to derive, but we can apply them in more general settings. And in terms of classification, an expectation propagation solution for PF given Y is probably the gold standard. Uh, it was shown in uh, one of the standard Gaussian process books, Gaussian processes for machine learning by Carl Rasmussen and Chris Williams, that inference with EP uh, corresponds almost exactly with a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo solution which was run for several months, and the EP solution might take a few minutes. Uh, so it seems to work very, very well for Gaussian process classification. Uh, the issue with EP is it won't necessarily converge, and we don't know always when it will or won't converge, whereas variational Bayes does have certain guarantees which are nice and make it perhaps generally more robust. The approximation to the marginal likelihood, I think, is very valuable for learning kernel hyperparameters, which are very important for good performance, especially if we're using a kernel that has a lot of hyperparameters. So now let's consider a little bit of history. In early machine learning, we were using linear basis function models and generalized linear models. So the types of models that we discussed at the beginning of this talk, polynomials and so on. Often we had deterministic training procedures. The perceptron was an especially popular model that was used to solve linearly separable classification problems. It was inspired by an early model of a neuron. Unfortunately, the book Perceptrons, which proved that perceptrons could only solve linearly separable classification problems, also incorrectly conjectured that this limitation would apply to multi-layer perceptrons, i.e. neural networks, and this basically killed the field of neural computing for about 20 years. In the 80s, we saw the rise of neural networks, which went from a finite number of fixed basis functions to a finite number of highly adaptive basis functions. And the paper by Rummelhart et al. really invigorated research in neural networks research by by introducing backpropagation, a way of training these models quite nicely, and also showed that we could learn really interesting representations of the data with these adaptive basis functions. <coughs> so we could sort of discover these interesting features, and people were very, very excited about neural networks in terms of being able to eventually develop intelligent systems. They started being used in a lot of uh, industrial applications, like reading handwritten digits, uh, for bank ATMs. Deep neural networks were proposed but not popularized at the time due to computational and memory limitations. And in the early 90s, there started to be quite a few growing concerns about neural networks. The newfound expressing power came at the cost of a lot of interpretability, the lack of a principled framework for deciding upon network architecture, activation functions, learning rates, and so on, which all greatly affect performance. In the 1990s, we saw the rise of the kernel era. era. Uh, neural networks were obviously still very popular, though. And kernels allowed us this dual representation, which enabled us to use infinitely many basis functions through the kernel trick. And these models were extremely flexible, but retained interpretability and were very manageable. You didn't really need an expert to tune a lot of parameters. Uh, there fairly robust models, and support vector machines became very popular for classification. Bayesian nonparametrics has perhaps never been standard, but uh, it definitely saw a rise in popularity in the 2000s in machine learning. Some of this was triggered by Neil's work showing that Bayesian neural networks converge to Gaussian processes as you have an infinite number of hidden units. Uh, a lot of new nonparametric methods were uh, introduced, like hierarchical Dirichlet processes and Indian buffet processes, which have found a lot of interesting applications. Neil argued that Bayesian nonparametric models naturally reflect our beliefs in a lot of cases and can get very good performance in a lot of cases. And many new powerful models were introduced for approximate inference, which allowed these very flexible models to be applied to all sorts of 
situations that were previously inaccessible. And researchers in cognitive science were speculating that rich priors combined with Bayesian inference could explain a lot of powerful human generalizations, and non-parametric priors were really especially expressive. But perhaps some of the standard kernel and Bayesian non-parametric methods are not perhaps as flexible or as scalable as we would like for really big data problems. And deep neural networks have shown to be very good on a, a number of important problems recently, especially, for example, in the ImageNet competition, which has greatly increased the profile of these models. Many of the old concerns about neural networks actually remain and haven't been fully resolved, but we've seen a lot of good progress, for example, using Bayesian optimization to tune the structure of neural networks. So we went from finitely many fixed basis functions to neural networks, which have very adaptive basis functions, to infinitely many fixed basis functions with kernel methods. So it seems very natural then to consider infinitely many highly adaptive basis functions, perhaps encapsulated by a Bayesian non-parametric framework, which would give us intuitive control over our inductive biases through a kernel function, which would be interpretable which uh, could possibly have sophisticated training procedures, but they would probably be robust in the sense they wouldn't require a lot of hand tuning and uh, expert knowledge. And would have uh, this nice property that the amount of uh, information the model is expressing scales with the amount of available data. And in the next lecture, we'll be talking about ways to build these types of models for pattern discovery problems. So since we have a little bit of time, I will actually go through and briefly introduce support vector machines as well. So Zico gave an interpretation of support vector machines as being like logistic regression with a hinge loss. So uh, I will uh, present the maximum margin perspective. Imagine we start with some kind of linear model. And we have some kind of de decision function f. And if f is greater than 0, we will classify the input x as belonging to class 1. If it's less than 0, we'll classify it as belonging to f2. We can imagine we have two points that are on the decision surface. That means that our decision function will equal zero at those points. And we can therefore derive from the relevant system of equations that the dot product of our weight vector w with uh, the difference between these inputs will equal zero, which means that the weight vector is going to be orthogonal to the decision surface. The normal distance from the origin to the decision surface can be computed by just taking the vector projection of this weight vector w with the inputs x. And we know on the decision surface, f of x is going to equal 0. So uh, this distance is just going to be uh, minus our bias over the length of the weight vector. Now suppose we want to find the orthogonal distance to the decision surface for any arbitrary input x. So x, for example, could be an image. It's our input. And we want to classify whether the image corresponds to a particular letter, for example, A or not A. Now, if we uh, break apart any arbitrary input vector, we can write it as this orthogonal component, x, per x perpendicular, which I've drawn in this diagram here, plus um, R, which is what we're trying to solve for, times something in the direction of W, our vector, which is orthogonal to the decision surface. Now, if we take the dot product of both sides of that equation with our weight vector w and add a bias, we can actually solve for r. So uh, w times x perpendicular, for example, will be 0. And that's just equal to 
f of x over the length of the wake vector w. Now, instead of considering this linear model, let's actually transform our inputs into some higher dimensional space with this feature vector or this basis function vector, 5x, and then consider a classifier that is separable in this new space. So here we might have had x1 and x2. on the horizontal and vertical axis. Now we've basically just transformed the x's with this basis vector phi. And what we want to do in a support vector machine is maximize the distance from the closest point, the orthogonal distance from the closest point to the decision surface. And that basically translates into equation 142 here, which is quite a messy optimization problem. But if we notice that the, dis the distance from this point to the decision surface is unchanged by rescaling our weights in our bias, we can actually use that to set the, uh, uh, this equation here in 143 equal to 1 for uh, the closest point. And yn, for example, is our label. So this could be uh, 1 or minus 1. And we can then use that to reformulate our optimization problem so that we're trying to maximize the inverse of the length of this weight vector w or equivalently uh, the minim minimize the uh, squared length of this weight vector w subject to the constraint here that yn times our model is greater than or equal to 1. And we can do that optimization by using Lagrange multipliers and then differentiate our objective function with respect to our free parameters. And we can solve this equation and find that the solution takes the form of inner products of basis functions. So we can invoke the kernel trick to replace those inner products with actual kernels. And this allows us to go into an arbitrarily high dimensional space. We can then solve our optimization problem subject to the constraints in 149 and 150. And to classify new points, we have this decision function, which is written uh, in equation 151. Again, we can see this is an example of the representer theorem. Now, it might actually be not a good idea to say that we want all points to be linearly separable in this high dimensional feature space because we might have outliers, poorly labeled points. And so we can account for that by introducing what are called slack variables, which penalize misclassified points proportional to their distance on the wrong side of the decision boundary. And when we do that, we end up with a slightly modified optimization problem and a greatly improved algorithm for classification. So that's it for part one of the talk. Uh, are there any questions? These are some references. They're not all inclusive, but uh, they can be used as pointers for further reading. Was anything unclear? Is there, does everyone just understand everything really well? Or <laughs> OK, well, we have about 10 minutes. So uh, we might as well actually go into the next part of the talk. So I said that we were going to try and develop models that would automatically be able to extrapolate on these sorts of problems. So we considered the CO2 problem where we actually built up a model that could uh, extrapolate quite nicely. But in doing that, we performed a lot of the interesting pattern recognition ourselves. And we would like to automate that process. We can consider a, perhaps a more sophisticated example here where we uh, see the blue curve and we want to extrapolate something that is in the missing region. To do that, we would probably try and itemize some features. So we would see peaks at 10 and minus 10. We would uh, perhaps see symmetry about the origin. Uh, so we might have an idea about what goes in the missing region, but we, not, we might not be completely sure. And I will uh, 
not show the truth until the end, so I'll let that be a surprise, and we can see whether actually the truth is very surprising to us or not. We can consider modeling this data with various popular kernels. So here I'm calling the RBF kernel the squared exponential kernel, just for some variety. We also have uh, the Matheran kernel with uh, uh, nu equals three degrees of freedom, the rational quadratic kernel, which is used for multi-scale data, and the periodic kernel. We've derived all of these kernels. And when we use the GP to model this data, we get the uh, extrapolations that are shown in this figure here with the different colored curves. The green is the truth, the blue is the training data, and the rest are just extrapolations using GPs with those kernels. We shouldn't be surprised at seeing this kind of performance because there isn't very much structure we can learn with these kernels. We just have, for example, a length scale hyperparameter which will tell us how much these functions vary with the input space. Now, in the late 90s, in a collected volume about neural networks, David Mackay wrote a nice review of Gaussian process models and pointed out that although we can derive Gaussian processes from infinite neural networks, when we do that, we actually lose the correlations between the adaptive basis functions and the multiple outputs that we have in a neural network model. And we can't actually use a Gaussian process to discover the interesting structure in the data that we might be able to discover with a neural network with the popular covariance functions that we have. These are very good at solving a number of problems, but they're basically just smoothing devices. And an answer to that criticism is to develop more expressive covariance functions that can learn interesting representations of the data that are very interpretable. And one way of doing that is to embed Gaussian processes into an architecture that looks something like a neural network. So in this case, we have our inputs x, which are observed, our outputs y1 to yp, which are observed. We have our latent basis functions. And these are all chosen to be Gaussian processes. And by mixing these basis functions together with a matrix, we actually induce an expressive process over non-stationary kernels. And this will allow us to discover interesting structure in the data. For example, in this model, we can discover the spatially varying correlations between different heavy metals. So each Y, for example, in this network can be considered a different heavy metal concentration. Cadmium is a function of latitude and longitude. Zinc is a function of latitude and longitude. And the result looks a little bit almost like a Google map or something. We can see features that might affect how these correlations vary with spatial location. The crosses here are where measurements have been made. And in this case, these are the spatially varying correlations between cadmium and zinc that have been learned by the model. And essentially, this has been done by having a very expressive covariance function. And this also allows us to extend Gaussian processes into the multi-output, multi-task setting. So that's one approach. And uh, it is an approach that's been used uh, to build more expressive Gaussian processes and Gaussian processes for multitask settings. The drawback to this approach is that it's often very task specific. You might not necessarily want to apply that model unless you actually had input varying correlations. In that case, the input varying correlations come from having uh, basically the connections in the model depend on the inputs themselves. So you can imagine the structure of that network actually changing as a function of the inputs. So you can imagine connections phasing in and out with time, for instance. Another approach would be to have compositions of kernels. Uh, multiple kernel learning is an example of this. Often you have, for example, compositions of RBF kernels with different length scales. Uh, you might have additive Gaussian processes which model low dimensional structure and high dimensional data. The issue in both of these uh, approaches is sometimes inference can be difficult, especially if your composition doesn't have many limitations. So multiple kernel learning works quite well, but it's, it's fairly specialized. If we were just to have an arbitrary composition of kernels, then the resulting induced distribution over functions that we get might be very hard to interpret and actually might have very strange inductive biases. And as a result, we might not make very sensible generalizations. And if inference isn't analytic, then it can be very hard to train these models because we don't have a nice sort of marginal likelihood. And it sometimes can be hard to interpret the kernel if we don't have a closed form expression for the kernel. 
In general, covariance regression, so kernel estimation, is a very difficult problem in the typical case where we have a single realization from a stochastic process. We can say almost nothing about the covariance function of that stochastic process if we assume its kernel is any positive definite function with equal probability. So we often assume stationarity, which suddenly gives us a lot more information if it's a reasonable assumption. For example, now we can say that the covariance between a pair of function values is the same as the covariance between any other pair of function values that are the same distance apart in the input space. So this is very useful. And as we said, Bochner's theorem allows us to express a deterministic relationship between stationary covariance functions and spectral densities. And we might have more intuitions about spectral densities than we do about stationary covariance functions. For example, if we take the Fourier transform of a popular RBF kernel, we get a Gaussian distribution centered on the origin. If we take the Fourier transform of a Matheran kernel, we get a T distribution centered on the origin. And we can keep doing this and keep getting similar sorts of spectral densities. And this gives us the intuition that arbitrary additive compositions of popular kernels are going to have very limited expressive power because it's like trying to do density estimation with, for example, a scale mixture of Gaussians centered on the origin, which is not a model we would generally use for density estimation. So what do we actually use for density estimation? Quite often, scale location mixtures of Gaussians are quite popular because we know that we can approximate any density function to arbitrary precision with enough components. But we also know with the finite number of components in that model, we often have a very flexible density model. For example, with a mixture of five Gaussians, we can approximate a number of density functions very well. And therefore, because we have this deterministic relationship between spectral densities and stationary kernels, we would be able to approximate a number of stationary kernels very well, even with a finite number of components in that spectral density model. Now, we can actually let the spectral density equal a scale location mixture of Gaussians and very happily take the inverse Fourier transform of that model to derive a closed form expression for new types of kernels. One caveat is that the spectral density has to be symmetric about uh, a frequency of zero, for example, and that's because the kernel has to be an even function of tau. This derivation here has been shown for one input dimension. We can generalize it for higher input dimensions. Essentially, equation 165 forms a basis for all stationary kernels. So it can be considered sort of one component of the spectral mixture model. And we can naturally interpret the parameters in uh, this model. For example, uh, the mu's correspond to the centers of these Gaussians in the spectral density, and the variances correspond to the bandwidths of these Gaussians. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? So let's actually use this kernel to try and perform extrapolation on some of, some of the examples that we've looked at so far. So we have our observations. We'll do the standard Gaussian process regression assumption. Uh, F is distributed as a GP with a spectral mixture kernel and hyperparameters theta. The spectral mixture kernel is flexible because it can approximate many different kernels for different settings of theta. And the goal is to try and learn theta. That's where all the learning is really taking place. We can use the marginal likelihood to try and learn these hyperparameters. Like we said earlier, it compartmentalizes into a model fit and a complexity penalty term. And once the hyperparameters are trained, we can make, condition, we can make predictions conditioned on those hyperparameters, or we could even try to integrate them away. We could sample. So basically, we're learning these hyperparameters through marginal likelihood optimization. So, if we do that and run this model on the CO2 example, we get the predictions made by the black curve here, which are very close to the truth. And the gray shade shows 95% of the posterior predictive mass. And this, very importantly, has happened automatically without very much human inter intervention. Uh, the hyperparameters were initialized quite naively, and we just get this kind of extrapolation. On the right, we can see the learned spectral density. 
which will help us interpret our model. So uh, we can see a peak at 1.2, which corresponds roughly to the uh, frequency of a year that we see in the data, or sorry, the period of a year that we see in the data. Uh, and the reason it's at 1.2 instead of 0.2 is because it's been aliased. That's something that can, we, we can fix quite easily. But since the data is sampled monthly, anything greater than a frequency of 1 will be aliased backwards in the spectral density. So this is just a pedagogical example here. We see a peak near 1, and that's kind of interesting because it's actually aliasing a mean function in this Gaussian process. And we haven't talked too much about mean functions, but we can do that later if there's sufficient interest. And we see all sorts of other peaks. Uh, and essentially, we can understand each peak roughly as a feature that's been discovered in the data and the width of that peak as some kind of uncertainty in how much that feature should actually generalize. We can also use this model to try and reconstruct standard covariances. So this is basically a sanity check. For the picture on the left, I basically chose a Matheran kernel, which has been represented in green. It's got relatively heavy tails, and then sampled from a GP with that kernel, and then plugged those data points into the spectral uh, mixture estimation model to try and recover that covariance kernel. And the recovered kernel is shown in black. And it can model these heavy tails quite well. The kernel that's estimated using a RBF model is shown in red. And the empirical uh, covariance function is shown in pink. And this is quite interesting because the spectral mixture kernel is infinitely differentiable. And it'll give rise to infinitely differentiable functions. And people criticize the RBF kernel for being overly smooth. But I think the answer to that criticism would be that if we can approximate the spectral density of a finitely differentiable kernel very well, then we can also approximate these finitely differentiable functions very well, and we're OK. The reason that the uh, empirical covariance here doesn't look very sensible is because it, although it has this sort of inductive bias of stationarity, it doesn't have the bias that covariances generally increase as a function of distance. On the right, we have a more sophisticated kernel that we want to reconstruct. It's uh, a mixture of rational quadratic and periodic kernels. And again, the spectral mixture model can reconstruct this kernel quite accurately. And the reconstruction is shown in dashed black. In this example, I've sampled from a discrete time autoregressive Gaussian process to create the blue curve. And in this case, the model actually has strong negative covariances. And Incidentally, it actually looks somewhat like something like a natural sound. The true kernel for this process is shown in green. And the recovered kernel using a Gaussian process with a spectral mixture is shown in black. And we can almost exactly recover that kernel. And the learned spectral density is shown in black in figure C as well. And we can see a peak near a frequency of a half. And this corresponds to these oscillations that happen roughly every two units. So the point here is that we can learn negative covariances quite naturally, and we can learn kernels that are outside of the model class. Now, on the right in green, I've actually shown the completion of this problem here. And I'm curious, is anyone actually surprised by that function that we've drawn in the center? To create this data set, we have basically just used a combination of three sync functions. So a sync function is just sine x over x. We have placed a sync function at the origin, a sync function at minus 10, and a sync function of 10, and then withheld the data between minus 5 and 5. And the reconstruction using a Gaussian process with a spectral mixture kernel is shown in dash black. It's almost perfect, which is almost a bit suspicious that it can reconstruct that well. So it's interesting to see whether people are actually surprised by the true data there. And the spectral mixture kernel is actually doing something quite interesting in this case. It's, although this is a non-stationary function, it's actually embedding it into a stationary pattern. And this is something a human might do. If we saw sync functions centered at minus 10 and 10, and especially if we saw one, another one centered at 0, and we were asked to, to extrapolate what's going on around x equals 100, then we might draw another sync function. And so although it's non-stationary data uh, in principle, 
uh, we can always embed this non-stationary da non data into a larger stationary pattern, and that's really the inductive bias of the spectral mixture model. So it's uh, just after four now, so we'll continue part two tomorrow. Thank you.